Hello, good evening. And I already even have Iberak Ibe Ikarawaji Esukile. Thank you so much for being on board already, <laughs> taking the front seat. I want to especially welcome you to this extraordinary third edition at the Visionary Talk Show. Thank you so much for diving on board this night. We are going to have a breathtaking time. Your mind is going to be astonished by powerful wisdom that is going to help you create new realities in your life. I'm extremely excited that I get to sit with someone I really, really respect and admire, and I can't wait for his uh, inspiring journey to power you through for the next level. So you are welcome to this night. It's going to be extraordinary. Welcome, Ola Dayo and Uluwapo. My book, uh, Just Gang, Front Seat Gang, you're welcome. Maureen and Degbu, you are welcome. Thank you so much. I am like delirious with delight and excitement. Um, thank you so much, Wura, and you're welcome to, to tonight. It's going to be like really, 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 really extraordinary. I am just, I don't know, I have no words to express the joy that I feel about all of us just getting together and having this beautiful time because wisdom really works. Wisdom really works, right? Can you guys try to focus? Can you can you work on that for me, guys? We are here to feast on wisdom. Don't make it about my beauty. And I didn't come with all my beauty. I left some because I know that if I came in full, it would be a lot. And I didn't want to, you know, do that to you. But anyway, welcome, Amaka Nene, Dr. Lewis. You're welcome. Itunu Oyeniro, you are welcome. Eni Tuajaya, excited to have you, Bodam. You are welcome. Kemi, welcome, welcome, welcome. And you know that what makes tonight even all the more special is it's a big reveal night. This is the night that I get to announce to you how you can be a part of Visionary Compass, which is our 40-week accelerator program for visionaries, founders, executives, change makers like you who want to clarify, launch, and scale your next level vision. So, hey, we're here for it all the way tonight, okay? Um, I'm excited to have you. I'm so excited. I already have my guest, brother and friend, Dr. Ni Borire, in the studio, and very soon I'm going to be bringing him right on it's going to be a memorable, completely unforgettable experience. So thank you for taking the uh, front row and just getting right into tonight because you are not going to forget tonight in a hurry. Okay, what I want you to do for me tonight is let's start off by letting me know where you're tuning in from as we've done every night uh, since the talk show started. After that, we're going to go on to talk about the experiences we've had with Lady J and Queen O. Okay, so let's start off. Tell me where you are joining us from tonight, and then we get on to sharing what our experiences have been so far in the program. Where are you joining us um, from tonight? Let me know. Fantastic. Welcome, Tega from uh, Federal Capital Territory, Aramide is in Lagos, Amaka in Liverpool, UK. Uh, to the world, and your any tone from Lagos, I be from Potakot, Abisola from Ontario in Canada, and Uluapo from Lagos, Maureen from UK, uh, Stella from Canada, uh, Chioma from Lagos, Chizaba from Abuja, Kende, a proud new member from UK, Ife from Perth in Australia, Chichi from Houston, Texas, welcome to Simply Taller from Peterborough in UK. Tammy from Lagos, Maureen from Ibadan, Nancy from Lagos, Olajumoke Olafare from Aja Island. Welcome. Josephine from Cape Town, Nene from Abuja, Oge Taiwo from Salisbury in the UK, Oluwa also from the UK, uh, Tammy Topper from Atlanta, excited to have you, Itunu from Lagos, Chema from Lagos, super, super excited to have you. Welcome, Mary Mary, front row gang. Chrissy from UK. Hello, Chuku from Enugu. Olamide from Ogun. Tammy Tokwe from Lagos. Very delighted to have you, my sister. Ido Tehila is in. You are super welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello from Enugu. Excited to have you as well. 
Coach Bamike is in the building. You are welcome. Fumilola from Lagos, you're welcome. Olushere from Hertfordshire in the UK, you are welcome. Excited to see you. Thank you, Do, joining us from Lagos tonight. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Adela, you're welcome from Lagos. Super excited to have you joining us this precious evening. And the numbers are building. You have to remember to share this link. Remind your friends. Put it in that WhatsApp group. Put it on your WhatsApp status. Take a moment. Put it on your family group, your sister and sister-in-laws, brothers and brothers. In law, your parents have to be a part of this conversation. Okay, uh, we're excited to have Ani Ekan from Dubai, Titi Lokwe from the UK, Simisolua from Ibadan. You are welcome. So take a moment now and you want to take this link on YouTube, share it on Facebook, on Instagram, push out the email to your friends who have to be here, put it on your WhatsApp status, on your WhatsApp group, send it as an SMS, but boom, ensure that everyone you care about is a part of tonight. Tonight is extra, 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 extra special. Fumilola, you are welcome, my doctor from Lagos, Nigeria. Super excited to have you on board tonight. Let's go on to talk about what has been the most, um, your light bulb moments, listening to Lady Jogotade on Saturday, listening to Queen Omomi on Monday. Omolola, welcome from Indiana in the US. Ofere, welcome from Port Harcourt. Let me know what stands up for you. Maybe a quote, maybe uh, the experience. What is your light bulb moment? What are you already working with? What are you What are you most blown away by and you want to make a change? Um, you want to use as a tool to make a change in your life. Give that to me. I'm super delighted to hear um, what your experience has been so far with the visionary talk show. So let me know. Remember I said to you, it's the big reveal day. This is the day that you get a chance to literally change your life and change your capacity to fulfill the vision that is on your heart, okay? You can get access into Visionary Compass. Finally, you can access Visionary Compass from tonight. It's our 40-week um, accelerator program for executives, founders, visionaries, and change makers like yourself. And it gives you an opportunity to be able to clarify, launch, and scale that big next level assignment that is on your heart. So if you've ever said, DDK, how do you do these things? Or you've ever looked at someone else and felt like, you know, DDK, how, I mean, whoever, like, how do you get this kind of results? Then it's important for you to be willing to make the investments that shifts you into a new lease of life and possibilities. Stella says, secret place for the blueprint. Joko Tade's, Lady Joko Tade's session was fire. Anita Ajayi says, the power of solitude from Lady Joko Tade was so powerful. I love it. IB says, Lady Joko Tade encouraged me to keep putting in the work because all things will eventually work out. When she said, it took me 40 years to be an overnight success, it hit differently. Lara, you're welcome from the UK. Chi Chi says, um, can you please repost the video with Lady Jokotade? So that video is uh, accessible if you, you know, are on our mailing list. We've shared the link with people on our mailing list. Because of how deep she went on her personal story, we thought to make it unlisted. So if you're not on our mailing list, um, our team is going to put up a link to our mailing list and you can sign up and then you'll be able to have all the replays available to you um, just, you know, right in your email. I love it. It always says, just do you. And that's what you hear from both Jogotade and Omomi. Just do you. Everyone is going through stuff, treasure silence, but most importantly, your walk with God. I love it so much. Olushe says self-identity is key. Omolola says, my lab moment with baby Jogotade was stop creating product. For my church people will add value to people globally and to everyone. I love it. Lara says, God himself will announce you when the time is right. Omomi spoke about self-identity and not wearing other people's label. Omomi's session was something else. It was so powerful. Like she came with the beauty of vulnerability and she taught us things that, you know, 
it's underneath what people are talking about. But we all need these lessons if we're really going to be able to live our best lives. Alam, this is the challenge to create products that will touch lives over the world and not just church people or believers. Uh, from Lady Jokotadi was my light bulb moment. I love it. Abisola talks about operating from a place of weakness. So good. Lady Jokotadi really spoke to this, how the world is all about people being powerful and being self-sufficient, but there is actually a dimension of power and strength that is in weakness. So good. Just so good. I love it. Okay. Chema talks about the fact that self-love is actually internal and not mainly um, external. And that has stuck with her from the session with Queen Omomi. I love it. Sim Lulua says, remove yourself from the noise. See God's help and counsel from Lady J's session. It was like I'd never heard it before. It was so strong. I'm excited. Ola Daya talks about what Omomi shared. Being my authentic self ensures I'm connecting with those people who are my proper tribe because spirit calls out to spirit and vice versa. This one was so good to me too. I thought this is like the literal story of my life just because I refuse to play to the stereotypes, but I stay authentic to who I am. I continue to attract powerful people like yourself, right? There could have been many places that you'd be tonight but you chose to hang out with me and it's because we are family and I love it. Amaka talks about how you look in the mirror and say all the great things about yourself as a form of speaking life into yourself. And yes, uh, it always reinforcing the power, the beauty that we found in a mom's vulnerability at the session on Monday. Lara talked about going back to Genesis 1 when the Lord started creating the world and he validated it, then went to the plan for the next day. So you've got to learn to uh, create seasons around your visions and validate the work that you have been called to do. I love it. Timmy Topper talks about, um, with a moment's talk, it was reinforcing how it's important to seek solitude and to get to know who you really are. This is so true. Olubimi talks about validation obsession as something that stood out from her. And you'd have heard it from even Jukotani's session, how be it much more from Omomi's session. And then she talks about if you deliberately become something, um, if you're not deliberately becoming something, you become something anyway. That was so good as well. And Ekan says, Omomi revealed the importance of understanding your identity or standing the risk of falling prey to the various labels that the world puts on us. And this is so good. Fumla talks, Fumla talks about crafting the message to reach a global audience, not speaking Christianese, but being kingdom minded. That's so good. And there you have it, a link for you to be able to um, join you know, our mailing list, as well as access all of the replays from the visionary talk show show sessions. Some of them may really go so deep that we're unable to just put it uh, for public access. But for everyone who signs up on the mailing list, you'll be able to access all the replays. Uh, we'll shoot you those links because we want you to continue to grow with them. Tim Tokwa talks about many highlights from the two talks. Joko's talk was basically God saying to me, that is a living example of where I am taking you to. Wow, so good. And Chichi talks about solitude and seeking God diligently for his will um, for your life. I'm going to take Josephine as we go on tonight in the session with my brother. Josephine says, I got this from Queen Omomi that no matter what you're doing now, put your mind to it. Learn so much about it. No knowledge is a waste. It will pay, uh, it will, it will pay forth one day. It will become valuable and useful. And that is so precious. Okay. Thank you so much for really sharing. Amaka is still sharing about how she's reminded that God doesn't look at our age, uh, but waits for when we are ready. Frank is also talking about how to have the right spirit as well as the right content. Guys, thank you for convincing me that you have been here. You've been taking these insights. You're not joking with these learnings and you're going to work with this wisdom. I continue to, you know, just really release my faith that this experience, this learning, this insight will be like a watershed moment for you, right? Will be a watershed moment for you. It's going to birth in you uh, new dimensions of thought because it is thoughts that produce new possibilities. It is new thoughts that produce new visions. New visions create new futures, literally, literally. 
So a vision is literally catching the future from the womb of tomorrow and then incubating that, co-creating multidimensional spaces in the future. And I am just like, I have a great desire for each and every one of you. They are going to find your answers. You're going to have the strength, a distraction-free life that helps you move into your higher possibilities. Whatever things have been put in your heart that can give you capacity to create change, whatever things have been put within your heart that give you an opportunity to make a difference in the world, you're not going to shortchange yourself. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to play small. You're not going to doubt your superpowers. You're not going to have a possi possibility blindness. You're not going to underestimate your endowment. You will go forth. You will find expression. You know, the distractions will give way and you break into big possibilities. It's the year of the visionary. You're going to see it so vividly. You're going to remember that I continue to share it with you. It's the year of the visionary. It's the decade of the visionary. It's the year of the future forward female. So if you're here, it's like double advantage for you. You've got to step up leveraging the endowments you've been given as a woman. And you've got to take your place, right? But whether you're man or woman, it's a year of the visionary. And what that means is that even if you didn't know what you wanted to do with your life before, this is the year where you're going to get in court, impregnated with a compelling vision. If it was not clear, if it was hazy and you were not sure what to do, you are now in the year where things will become so clear. You're going to you're gonna get a blueprint and your teachers will not be far from you. I've been sent as a teacher for visionaries. It's what I've done actively in the last seven to 10 years, right? And I have literally just condensed the proofs of the things that I know work into a framework, a methodology that I want to show you over 40 weeks. And you are going to carry that success framework into your decade, into the years coming. And you're going to be able to replicate your superpowers. You're going to be able to multiply yourself. You will take that idea and you'll be able to move it into an institution. In the course of the next one to three years, you'll literally be unable to recognize yourself. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so powerful. And the reason it's important now to step into your visionary state more than ever before is because it is not in the hands of the government to fix our communities, our countries, and our continents. I'm telling you, it's in our hands. We've seen it now. Even for more developed clients, we're starting to see that, except we rise and we start to take our place, there are still things that will not be done, even when the system works. So imagine if you're of African descent or you are on the continent of Africa. There's no answer outside you know, uh, visionaries who rise with a compelling desire to create change and begin to mobilize resources. So whether you want to build a university or you want to start an investment club for rural farmers or you want to run, a, you know, a coaching program for teenagers or you want to write 100 books in your lifetime, whatever it is you want to do, you want to create short films that reorient, you know, the populace about the power of right values, Whatever it is you've been, that burns in your heart, you want to create new educational curriculum that integrates entrepreneurship from primary school level. Whatever it is, you want access to healthcare for the vulnerable population. You want to do something with special needs children. Whatever you've been given, I want to walk that journey with you, right? And that's why we are giving you a chance to join Visionary Compass today. Today is a good day to put an advanced payment down on the kind of life you want to live, on the kind of impact you want to make, on the kind of place you want to get to, on the kind of legacy you want to leave, on the kind of example you want to be, right? Today is that kind of day. And it, it's all the more special to me because you might be listening to me and feel like, DDK, my case is different. You don't know my story. Um, I've experienced pain. I've experienced poverty. I feel limited. I don't know how to move forward, right? But I want to challenge you to just stay here. Stay here with us, right? There are things that you're going to hear today from Dr. Ni uh, Boriri that will challenge you at a different level of being. 
is going to completely blow your mind and is going to give you the tools that you need to make your purpose stronger than your pain. Okay? It's going to make your purpose stronger than your pain. And that is important. So if you feel like I've been in pain, I've had challenges, I've not really discovered myself, I'm too timid to, you know, step up and, and, and do the work in my heart, whatever it is that feels like it's holding you back, we're going to have that conversation today. And when you when you hear Dr. Nee's story and who he has become, <laughs> you are going to know that there's nothing stopping you if you set your heart to it and you use the power of wisdom. Lara, Visionary Compass actually opens officially today. Of course, we've got stalkers who have bombarded us like in the last few hours using the back end, going through Google. <laughs> and that's also good. We've registered and we're excited about that. But we're here today to give you a chance to be a part of Visionary Compass. And I have a 20% offer coming, 20% discount coming to you today. Like this is too good to be true, but it's true and it's good. Okay. So let me know in the comment section if you are ready for Dr. Nee Borire. I want to know. I need to know if you are like ready, ready. If you are like pumped about what is going to come on tonight, because I'm about to bring him on the stage. Let me know if you're ready. Be like DDK. I'm ready for Dr. Nee. Just, just, I mean, I'm super ready. I want to know that you are ready. I love it. IB says, I woke up ready. I woke up ready. Ooh, so good. You ready, ready, ready. Fantastic. I'm going to be reading Dr. Nee's uh, uh, um, abridged profile, and then you're going to see his face. Remember I told you that he's a whole vibe, and you're going to confirm that for yourself tonight. Nee Boriri is a multifaceted and dynamic individual an award-winning neurologist, neuroscience researcher, lecturer, author, speaker, and change agent. He's on a mission to help people navigate change without losing their purpose, identity, and individuality. He's the director of Southwestern Neurology and a neuroscience lecturer at the University of New South Wales. His research has won many awards, including the prestigious Gold Seth Young Investigator Award presented by the American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine, AANEM. Uh, He's also the founder and host of Brain, Mind, and Change, BMC, an online series which leverages on his scientific background and pastoral assignment to teach people how to achieve mastery of their brain, rewire their mind, and change the world. An Amazon best-selling author, he has written two books, in, including his autobiography titled Navigating Change, Timeless Secrets for Growth in an Ever-Changing World. He and his wife, Yemi, pastor Beautiful Gate, Sydney in Australia. They are blessed with two wonderful boys. Guys, did you hear neuro, neuro, like brain, oh, hey, God, oh, like, you know, that one is different. Brain's tough. So, I mean, I'm here for it. I'm just here for it. Let's get Dr. Nee Bure right in the studio. You are welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for that amazing introduction. Wow, I'm thank too you. excited to have you, my brother. How are you me feeling too, today? Me too. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I woke up a bit groggy this morning about oh. two and a half hours ago. It's six twenty-four a.m. here, but I'm really excited. Oh, I'm really excited. for the sacrifice. Uh, absolutely. I, I have to say, I've, I've just been enjoying. Yesterday, I immersed myself. My wife and I were watching this lady, Joko Tadi. We went back to the, I we, tell you. we sat down. My wife just heard the voice and she said, Who is that? Who is that? So she sat beside me, and this woman was just releasing. Please shout out to her. She's amazing. Amazing, amazing session. She is. Thank you. I'm glad you got a chance to look at it. Like, we are still reeling from the power of the last two sessions and Absolutely. our excitement. You're the first man on the show. <laughs> We've got a second man coming toward the end. So yes. we need that vibe and that different energy. And yes. you already know that I greatly admire you, but you may not know why. One of the big reasons for me is your humility. 
in the presence of what you've accomplished, like what you've done, you're a really respected neurologist, researcher, you've done brilliant work, you're obviously a genius. <laughs> well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, so, and then one meets you in person, you are, you're simple, you're warm, you're happy to connect to others, to serve, to help. I think that's the first thing I'm, 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 I'm very, curious to really ask you about what's made you into this person in spite of your enormous achievements? Uh, well, that's a very deep question, I think. Um, I think it goes back to what I was before, you know, mm. um, like, like the great Padoweski, this great Polish pianist who uh, became the Prime Minister of Poland, you know, the Queen of England was interviewing him after World War II. He went to play in Buckingham Palace, the piano. And the king of, king of England said, Padawiski, wow, you're such a genius. Who made you this? And he said, he said, Queen, before I became a genius, I was a drudge. You know, mm. so this great pianist who later became the prime minister of um, Poland after Hitler was defeated. So the reality is that I think a lot of my attitude, so sort of my my view of life is mostly influenced by my upbringing, mostly influenced by my um, the, the, the challenges and the pain that I've gone through in life. I think that sort of humbles you and, you know, reminds you of your humanity. Um, and I think on one hand, it reminds me, you know, that um, all that I've achieved, you know, is credit to God, you know, and by his grace. And, and so that sort of makes me um, see the bigger picture. On the other hand, I've also, through my work, but as a neurologist uh, and through my pastoral assignment, I've seen people with bigger troubles, people with more uh, painful experiences. And so I understand that mine is not the worst of trials. And no matter what I've gone through, there's somebody out there who has it worse off. So I think when I understand the two aspects, the two ends of the spectrum, I think it just makes me feel that, listen, I'm just at best, you know, um, an educated beast, if not for his grace. Um, mm. The other... Um, point that I would certainly um, emphasize there is that, as you probably would know, some of the people watching right now, um, reading that profile, you know, it's still a work in progress by the grace of God. I know I'm still going to achieve a bit more or a lot more. And that that's not even the end. And I think in the next 10 years, you know, in line with the visionary stuff that we're all doing, you know, that would be a completely different profile, I hope. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, but here is a boy who Yes, I was academically gifted. At the age of 14, I finished high school. At the age of 16, I had a diploma in computing. Um, by 22, 23, I was a doctor. By 26, I was married. By 30, I was a specialist. By 33, 35, I had a PhD. I had a thriving business. Um, and so I would say that, yes, I knew that I was precocious. I knew I was academically gifted. And I knew that I had a heart for people. Um, but then all of this was in the, the background all of this was the background of um, family struggles of challenges of pain yes and if you um, have the chance of reading my book which i'm not promoting but you know as a matter of fact you would you would actually get the bigger picture that be, you know of the real man of the pain and i talked about my siblings i talk about you know the pain I have, even with my parents, my dad, you know, the lack of connection and all of those things. So, and I'm sure we'll still talk about some of those things, my background and our, all of those. So to come back to your question, you know, why do I feel grounded now? Why am I level-headed? I'm level-headed because I knew where I know where I'm coming from. I know that I came from extreme poverty, from having nothing. And I also know that where I am now is also relatives. I, I, I work with some people that have sort of who achieved a lot more than I have achieved right now in every sphere of life that I feel that this is nothing. And so I think that sort of, you know, humbles me and gives me a sort of broader perspective to life. So, you know, we haven't seen anything yet. Mm, wow. I love I, it. Oh, gosh. So all across the, the compass, you look at where you're coming from. You look at where you're going to. You look yep. at... Look at the challenges others are facing. You look at the success some have, and ultimately you're just like, I'm, I'm work in progress, and where I've come to, I've come to by grace, and there's still so much ahead. 
Oh gosh, touches me very deeply. I want to jump on on poverty a little bit. What we've been made to believe is that a poor background plays a significant role in shaping your mindset and your relationship with money. Yeah. And that people who are from a poor background uh, could get caught up in a scarcity mentality. Yeah. But you are by every by every standard in dollars quite a wealthy man, right? Yeah. What 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 is that what is that journey like, right? Is it true? Did you have to do a lot of work in rewiring your mindedness perspectives and your relationship with money to be able to steward money into wealth in your life today? Or, I mean, did it matter that you came from extreme poverty? And what role did that play in? In fact, I'm almost also asking the next question mm -hmm. around, how are you able to be both very cerebral and very like academically gifted and still like really entrepreneurial? I don't, yeah. people wouldn't expect someone who's looking at human brains and all that to be able to run a thriving in business. In the lab, just in the lab, eh? Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, I think it still goes back to my background. Okay. So we were initially, our two were middle class. So just let, to give you a bit of a background, my father met my mom, you know, my father was in his early mid 30s. My father married a bit late because he came from the village in Ondo State to Lagos. For those who are in Nigeria, or for who are, for those who are not from Nigeria, Lagos is a very big city um, in um, Southwest Nigeria. So my father traveled down, you know, was a printer. Um, he went to Yaba College of Technology, did a print, um, degree in printing, um, a diploma in printing, and worked at the Mint where they print money. So he was a printer. And my mom was a supervisor in Nitel those days until she was retrenched by the Buhari government in the early 80s. Um, and so when they got, you, you know, they met each other, they were middle class. My father just started his business. My father was, they were quite good. And they would tell us stories of having dates in London on the weekend. So my father would drive from Mint to Nitel, pick up my mom with two tickets to London without, you know, those days they, were, they didn't need a visa. So they would just yeah. get to the, to the airport. All right. My mom would ring um, a friend to tell her mom because my mom was the last born as six siblings had married. So she was just with her mom who was uneducated. And my mom would go to London, all right? And they get to London, uh, you know, that same Friday night or Saturday morning, take a train to Paris, Luxembourg. By Sunday night, she's back at Lagos, all right? And Monday, she's back at work. So that was kind of lifestyle they had. They were not like super rich, but they were comfortable. When my sister, my older sister was born, she did all her shopping in London and Belgium, and they had friends everywhere. So it was just this sort of simple life in the late 70s, early 80s kind of thing. Um, but my father's business crumbled at some point, and when his business crumbled, of course, you know, when people suffer and people go through hard times, the next thing they turn, turn to is religion. So for him, it became a religious thing, and from, you know, when you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you hear what all these prophets and everything say to you. At the end of the day, it was my mom's fault, really. That was what she was, was being told, and so that just drove a wedge in the family. Um, it was very abusive marriage. They really they argued a lot. They were very similar in their personalities. Very, hard. and I never enjoyed my childhood. I think from the time I became cognizant, and I was a bit precocious, as I said. So at the age of um, eight, I'd finished high school. You know, uh, sorry, I'd finished primary school. So. I was conscious of what was going on. That this was a very dysfunctional marriage, um, and you know, I just never I was never happy. I was never happy at home. Up till now, I still have the vivid images of my father beating my mom. My father was very, very, very. He yeah, was a very angry man, and I think he was angry because he felt he had dropped so low. And my mm. mom had never since eighty two, eighty three. I think eighty three when she was retrenched. My mom never walked again because she never had any need to work. My father was one printing jam form and um, jam jam exam whatever for jam. My father had a contract with jam, and was printing all the forms and exams every year. My father would buy a hundred rams to all the people in government. You know that was how we were, and then suddenly everything went away and we couldn't feed. It was that bad. There was a day we used to take we took all our textbooks to the bus stop to exchange that for fried baked beans and akara and stuff like that. That's how bad things were. We would sell clothes to just feed. Things were that bad. And I think the relationship crumbled. They were not Christians. Of course, they were churchgoers. My father was a chairman in 
society, Anglican church. My mom was, you know, they, they were all the, you know, they were socialites, you know, Lions Club. Tell me all the clubs. My father was there. And then suddenly all his friends abandoned him. Of course, if you don't have money, you can't keep those kind of friends. Um, and, and so that's sort of background. But as a young man, a young boy, I was really frustrated. I was never happy at home. I was always, I think there was a lot of aggression. There was a lot of anger, never connected with my siblings. I just felt odd in that situation. But then I wanted a better life, to be honest. I just wanted a better life. So at the age of 14, once when I left home at 14 plus to go to Yaba College of Technology for my diploma in computer science, never came back home up till today. So I left home at the age of 14. And that was it. Bye bye. I was I stayed on campus. Wow. Yes, never came back. I left home at the age of 14. And when I come back, in fact, by the time I came back, we had we had no room because we lived in a three bedroom unit. And um, we are my parents had five siblings and five, five kids. So I was second of five kids. Um, so I just every time I come back, I just sit sleep on the lounge. I had every all my stuff in my bag and I, I was just on campus because from Yabba Tech. I got an admission to University of Lagos. I just moved straight to University of Lagos. And of course, in medical school, we stayed 24 7, 365 days a week. So, you know, I pretty much lived on campus throughout until I came to Australia about 12, over 12, almost 13 years ago now. So that was just it. And I, and I think that relationship with my family became strained. I left home early, so I never really gelled with my siblings. All the milestones in teenage, the teenage years were not there anymore. I just became very academically focused and of course that was what i was gifted at so i just you know just give and then i, I think 14 plus just after high school i gave my life to jesus and sort of that gave me a sense of meaning so i was just you know buried in just um my relationship with god and service and my education so that is sort of the background to you know that and of course it became, it was a struggle because I know the question is about poverty, but I just wanted to give that background so people understand it. it. Yes. So for me, it was not just poverty in terms of finance. It was a, a broken relationship in my home, yes. a broken home. My father left home with my, my mom with five kids with no job. My mom had not worked since the early 80s. My father walked away, picked another woman in our street, in our neighborhood, and now had, had us two kids. They are now adults, they're in the university now, um, those two kids. So he left home, left my mom with five kids, all right? And my mom had no job. My mom would go in the morning to the abatio to, 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 to fight for scraps. She would do anything. The only thing my mom would not do would be drugs and prostitution. So for almost a decade, my mom was living a life of struggle. You know, how do I get these five kids? You know, um, how do I get to the point that I was the only one that could graduate? And, I, you know, she didn't even pay for that anyway. But... You know, that was just how difficult it was. We were in poverty, real poverty. I remember one Christmas morning, and I wrote this in my book, when we had nothing to eat on Christmas Day. We had absolutely nothing to eat. And we prayed that morning that neighbors and friends and everything will bring food. Do you know that that morning we ate, my mom went out that Christmas Day. I'm telling you, I'm feeling very emotional now, listening to the, um, actually thinking about this again now, to be honest. Um, I'm feeling very emotional. But that morning, my mom my mom is in australia now she's in tasmania with my sister my sister is also here my older sister they're in a different state um you know that morning my mom went out on christmas morning to just like a lioness you know those david attenborough's documentary when the lioness will leave the pops and just go out just i just need food for these kids you know you know what she came back with she came back with unripe plant and planting <sighs> unripe planting she came back with that two or three i don't know where she got it from so we boiled it. Gosh, it was so starchy, so acidic with palm oil. Wow. That was our Christmas breakfast. That was the only meal we had on that Christmas day till evening when some neighbors brought some food. That was when I that was when my war with poverty started. That was when I decided that you know what, I would never be a poor man. I I hated poverty so much. I hated it with so much. And for me then, it wasn't just about wealth. For me, it was just about being able to provide. I looked at my mom, I saw the pain in her eyes that just to put the basic stuff, she could not do that. And of course, for all of us, our relationship with our dad was, you know, we just felt he didn't care, you know. Um, and it got to a crescendo, you know. I When I got to Yabatech, of course, nobody could pay my fees. My WAEC fees, my mom took me to a friend and I remember how we knelt down to our friend's husband 
and he gave us 2,000 naira for my wife. So, because my father wasn't around, we knelt down and I remember, I still remember where we were in that unit, how we got 2,000 naira the day before the deadline of the WIAC because we couldn't get the money. That's how I got my WIAC paid. And then when I got to Yaba College of Technology for Computer Science, I did very well in Polyjam. I think I was the top three Polyjam that those, those years. For those, Polyjam is a licensing exam for um, polytechnics and colleges in Nigeria. So I got, uh, I couldn't afford you know the fees and everything so i just given my life to jesus at the time and our Sunday school teacher at church was an anglican church decided to support me with the poly jam thing as pretended actually so paid for my initial fees to have a college of technology and it was really hard at the time because before i got accommodation on campus i was going from home do you know what i would do I would leave home with my bag. I used to have a backo sack, backo black backo sack, like a shopping bag. I put in my books, wrap it, right? I had one or two shirts. One of them had, it was my father's old shirt, had, um, what do you call this? This button kind of thing, almost like the, what the soldiers used to wear kind of thing. It was a horrible pink shirt. Can you imagine? Pink shirt with a keto. All I had was, a, I, all, my, my, the only shirt I had was a keto sandal, keto, a blue keto sandal. Can't forget. So I would take my keto sandal, same shirt almost every day, <laughs> I just had two shirts and one pants, and so I washed them and everything. So I took my bag in the back. I was a 14-year-old, OND1, Yaba College of Technology. And I would leave home at, because lecture started at eight, I would leave home around six. Uh, we're living in Ipaja. And this was Yaba. For those who live in Lagos, it's, uh, I don't know if I've lost track now. I don't even know, you know, I don't know Lagos anymore. So anyway, I will carry my bag, my, you know, and I, because there's no transport fare, nothing. So I was sat knocking on neighbors' doors in our estate. We live in this um, low-cost um, housing estate in Ibadja and knock on doors. But there was this woman who was faithful. Anytime I knock a door, she would never send me back. Mrs. Bobe. We used to call her Mama Obe. She's probably in her eight, late 80s now. She would give me five naira, ten naira. That would be enough to get me on a Molue. Molue, I'd like to try Molue. You know, I, I don't know how. Molue is that this big bosses that you know anyway that would only allow me sorry i hope i'm not boring you ddk out no stop it just continue but what <laughs> okay so i just get into these big bosses and of course the five naira or ten naira will just be enough for me to stand so i can't sit you won't get enough you know to, so i'll stand with my bag and then when we get to Oshodi, that's Ipaja to Oshodi. When I get to Oshodi, those days Oshodi used to be muddy. I heard they've changed everything now. But those days, wow. When you get the bus from Yaba, for those who live in Lagos, from uh, Oshodi to Yaba, you know, so I will I would stay there and stay there. Probably I will, sometimes I will beg for transport. I was a student. I will beg for if I don't have enough, I will be stalking Oshodi begging just to get a campus. Listen, I've not even talked about breakfast. I've not talked about lunch. And I've not, you know that I did that for a year and God sustained me. That was why, you see, when I now go through my journey, now I understand what it means to live by faith. I woke up every morning and, you know, I never missed a day of school. For a whole year, I didn't get accommodation. Every morning I woke up, had my shower, hoping to get to school and to come back. And I'll get, well, get my bag in my taco bag, put on my keto sandal, you know, have my shirt well ironed, even though I had one shirt and it had a blue ink stain from those pens you put in there, you know, those biro you put there, there's a blue stain. I can't forget that. It will still be there with the blue stain. And I'll wrap stuff. And I was like, you know, 14, 15. I had pimples all over, read it all, all, all over my face. And I'll get on the Molue straight to Oshodi. When I get there, I had faith. I believe that I would get there. Sometimes the conductors will allow me to go in. Sometimes I would just perch at the edge of the of the truck, you know, just with one leg, just hoping until, you know, you, you get to school. And then when I get to Jibo, Jibo bus stop, for those who remember, know that area, I would walk to Yaba College of Technology. Do you know the first day I could afford a bike from Jibo bus stop to Yaba College of Technology? I give a testimony in the fellowship. Because I joined the fellowship at the time, I gave a testimony there and I said, Listen, today, for the first time in my life, I could afford a motorbike. I used to walk every morning. So that was it for me. But I was just determined. I hated poverty. I just felt, you know what? I had to make my life count. I had to make my life count. My wife, my older sister, was still stuck in secondary school. I'd gone ahead of her because I had 
double promotion and all that. So I was ahead of her and she was struggling with jam and wank. You know, my younger ones were, you know, it was difficult. We had nothing and it was mom alone. Anyway, one defining moment for me was when I went to Yaba College of Technology. Do you know despite that I became the graduate best graduate student? I graduated my last semester with a distinction. Yes. yes. And and um I joined the fellowship. I just gave my heart to Jesus and I was just serving God, you know. And then one one after I was uh, towards the end of my time in college, it was a two-year diploma. I applied for you know the University of Lagos through the JAM exam to study medicine. And I just got in straight away, to be honest. I didn't know anyone and everything. I, I got the admission. And I remember I ran, ran around, raised the money for the initial fees. But when we finished the first year um, at the main campus, we had to move to the College of Medicine at the uh, hospital. And I, I just didn't have fees. So I went back to my dad. I thought I had the, uh, my father was doing better at the time. And my father looked at me face to face and, and just said, you know, I can't help you. I, I just can't, I don't, you know, I, I can't even remember the context now. I'm not, you know, I knew his press was busy at the time. So I wasn't sure whether I was doing that out of spite for my mom or whether he really didn't have the money. But the longest, you know, short of it is that he just couldn't help. So that day I was so, my school fees were due. I just thought I was gonna pull out of medical school but of course, when I remember how God sustained me for two years at Yaba College of Technology, how many times for a whole year there was no breakfast. Yes. And lunch, I would go to the cafeteria, the main cafeteria there. I would be the last person to, I would just hang around there until everybody has gone. And then I would beg for scraps. Mama, sorry, I see this in Venezuela. She am a laku. That's it. I was, a, I was a student. I would beg for scraps. You know, I was a student. And I, was, I still believe I was still the, probably one of the best students in my class. <laughs> but I, that was how I, I was feeling. That was how I was feeling. You know the fellowship I joined? Do you know how I joined the fellowship? I went to one of the brothers who invited me to his room and he gave me lunch, beans and Gary. And then after that, I was so tired, I slept off. And that night he invited me for a vigil. Of course, after feeding me, I couldn't say no. <laughs> That's why I joined their fellowship, their campus fellowship. I just became friends with them because they were feeding me, really. Anyway, so, you know, when my father, back to the story where my father said, you know, all of that. So on Sunday uh, in our local church, I joined the children's church and I was teaching the children's church. Uh, now I was in first year, going to second year of medical, um, of, you know, medical school. And, and, you know, after the day, after the Sunday meeting, I was just sitting down in one corner. I was sad. And I just felt really down. And one of my mentors, who had been a teacher for a long time, he's a manager at Zenit Bank. And in fact, he's one of the big guys at Zenit Bank up till now, you know, walked up to me and he said, Me, what's happening? And I just said, um, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to leave medical school. I can't afford the fees. And he looked at me and he said, No, this will not happen. Mm. I don't know why he walked up to me that Sunday. I don't know what he did. But this man, who is, we have no really, like biological connection. This man just loved me. And today I consider him to be my father. He paid my medical fees from year two to year six. Wow. He paid and he gave me a monthly stipend of 10,000 naira every single month till I graduated. Oh. From that day, he said, Ni, I would take care of you. From that day, Mr. Yahweh, shout out to him. He's not on social media, so don't worry. He's not into all of these things. He was, do you know that up till today? Do you know up till today, even though he's a DGM in Zenit Bank, DGM is and he's a big boy, you know, the lucky banana, you know, this all these people, you know. It's never, never going to the Nigeria, the man, very humble man, good man. Do you know that up till today, he still teaches in the children's church? What? The morning, yes. DGM in Zenit Bank with all the, you know, when I go to his office, last time I was in Nigeria, 2018 or so, he's a big boy, like it's quietly big boy. You know, all his kids are overseas, Canada, Canada all over, everywhere. He doesn't have a child in Nigeria at the moment. All of them are, he's settled. And still yet every Sunday morning, he carries his back to teach young children. That was, that is, that's when I saw his life, I was like, wow, you know, 
you never hear a word from him. It's not on social media. Absolutely not on social media. But it's affecting life. Sometimes you don't have to. Some, you know. So anyway, good. <laughs> don't say let's not go there. Let's go there. Yeah. You yeah. see yep. oh, see, no, God. Yeah. oh gosh. Can First I can all, I just can, can I just take, can I just Please. take twenty seconds? Eh? Twenty go seconds. On. I just want to take twenty seconds. Okay. You know, did you just hear what he said now? Of course, there are a billion and one lessons. When I'm done, I will sit with this again and start to take my own notes. Ah, but did you hear what he just said? That man, are you aware, who was an angel in human form, who changed his life, right? Is not even on social media. Social media is great. But I continue to say this thing, and it's important we reiterate it. If you're a visionary and you are going to go far, if they would, if you'll be handed a next level assignment that has capacity to change lives, you must never forget two things. One of it is that there are things you will be mandated to do. You will get an opportunity to do that can change a person's life, but it's, it, you can't record that impact on media. Yeah. You cannot think about all the work that you get a chance to do in your life within the context of the media. You can't continue to play for the gram. That's the first thing you must note as a visionary. We've got an example in, in Mr. You are where blessings to his heart. The next thing is there are people that you require for your next level to birth legacy leadership who you can't even connect with on social media. So this thing that makes you believe relevance is all based on this social media matrix is unhealthy. There are people that you will beat your pathway to search out at the back end of spaces and places. And they are influential, powerful, wealthy, wise, but they don't even have a, an Instagram handle. And this thing has to be, we've got to crack and get it right. Yeah. So, sorry. Well, did you, can, yes. Can I just say something to that? Do you know that that week I had a reason not to turn up to church? I had a reason not to, because I came from campus. Remember, I was on campus at the time. So I used to come from campus to, back to Ipaja to teach in the children's church of an Anglican church. It was an Anglican church. It wasn't a, it wasn't a Pentecostal church. I would leave the campus every Sunday, travel at my own expense to teach young kids because I was a children's church teacher. And he was, he was teaching the older kids. I was teaching the younger kids. I turned up that day. Despite the fact that I knew that on Monday, despite the fact I knew Friday was a deadline. Friday was a deadline for school fees. I knew the deadline was yes. passed. I knew yes. I could not pay my fees. I knew I thought the next Monday I was going to defer my admission or give them an excuse. But I turned up. And I didn't go to him. I wasn't even, it wasn't even in my radar. Thank God I turned up. Thank God we finished the service. And thank God I was there. And he approached me. And I told him, I didn't try to hide it. I didn't try to, you know, and that relationship was forged. Do you know that <laughs> my story is so complicated? We can't finish this. You have to bring me back another time. Yes. Okay. Right. No, no. Yeah, I'll bring you back. Do you know that? Uh, so you, you asked the question about the entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, of course, when I was on campus. So when I was on campus, I paid for my sister's NCE through Mr. West support. And also, I was saving. So the ten thousand dollar naira I was getting every month, I paid my sister school fees, I paid my brothers um, and Echo and Waek, all of them. Now every single sibling I have is a graduate, like of my mom and my wife and I, by God's grace, will make sure that happened. All right, my brother is now an, an economist in, uh, in in Italy, in Trieste, is married with the son. My older sister, we brought her here. She's doing quite well with her husband and they're based in Tasmania. My younger sister, she's also doing quite well. She's actually joining us soon. And then the other sister into business. They're all graduates. All of them, University of Lagos, um, Ondo State University, two of them from University of Lagos. And one of them, my brother, we sent him to University of Trieste in um, Italy. And his graduate is, uh, you know, studied economics, you know. So that was all these five kids and now my mom today the same woman that was bashed and that could not today my mom has been since march last year my mom has been in australia enjoying life and everything and you know <laughs> house to my sister's house and she's going to be here maybe for another one or two years like she doesn't want to come yes back. all right <laughs> so so this is the same woman that you know hustled and hustled and hustled now but the point i wanted to actually bring out before we got, got to this point was that when i finished uh, 
so throughout medical school, you know, it was a bit of a, you know, I was doing business here and there uh, because I had done computer science. I was very good with data analysis. So all the people that in medical school were not good with doing, analyzing data analysis and doing the projects, I would do all of that, SPSS, SAP Info, all the different data analytic um, analytical tools. I was good at that. So all the master students, final year medical students, I was charging them 1,000, 2,000. In fact, I had people working for me. In medical school, it's here in my final year, I had a cupboard full of money all right three three i had I, in that year alone i analyzed about 33 poor projects three three thousand naira so i had people that was paying 10 10 naira per questionnaire most of them were kp studies so questionnaires so they will enter it into my software so i give them the software they will enter it in, and then i will do the magic behind the scene you know so i had that um you know I, when i was in medical school i was working as a doctor's assistant in a hospital in surulere from Idiaraba, mm. where we were. So I would, once we finish lectures, I'll go do a night shift, all right, with the doctor, you know, just assisting and everything. And then I'll finish at six or seven o'clock, get a bike. By eight o'clock, I'm on the wall drive with a consultant, all right? So that was it. I was all of hustle and bustle. But I just hated poverty. I felt I just needed to do something. I needed to provide. And while I was on school, I was paying the bills at home. I was paying for a lot of things at home. So even though I was a student, that was my life. You know, my mom would call me, oh, we need to pay for security in our clothes. I will send the money. I was a student. And that was basically how my life was. So when I became a doctor, my father came back home just when I became a doctor. And then he insisted, you know, I don't know what happened. I don't want to go into the details between himself and my mom and blah, blah, blah. But he, he had a falling out in the other place and then came back home. So he insisted that he wanted to do my induction party oh you know that's a distraction let's leave that <laughs> that's another i think the important story i wanted where i'm actually going to is the fact that after my father came back and i started working as an intern i'd not done nyc you know at the time in fact up to now i've not i didn't even do nyc at all uh but we were it was about i started an internship in january and my father fell ill in august so you see i knew i was going to go to australia because my australian testimony is a different story at all if i yes. have nothing that's part two. Don't worry. It's part two. <laughs> so that between January and August, I was working as an intern and I was saving all of my money. So most of my money I kept uh, I bought shares in Diamond Bank, Diamond Bank shares. That was when the bubble, you know, was shares were you know very hard. So I bought shares, put a lot of the money in shares, and I was just living, I was living, even though I was a doctor, I was living a very meager life just to see because I felt I needed to leave the country. I felt by that time, by the time I was an intern, I'd gotten a scholarship to go to South Africa for an um, exchange program. I'd been to the UK in 20, in 2006 or so for an uh, university college London to study neurology for a six-week program in neurology. That was a that was when I knew I was going to be a neurologist. So I had had that exposure. I've been like, you know, the first time I was in South Africa, 2004, 2005, I was like, is this? Uh, I said, no, I knew I was going to leave because I just needed to break that up. Yes. Yes. And and then in 2007, when I went to England, and that's a huge testimony, you, you know, you know, uh, let, let me mention the, the one. I know I'm going back and forth, but I'm going to come back to the, to, um, the internship thing but let me just mention when i went to south africa in 2004 you know i got the opportunity to go to south africa and i didn't have any money and i couldn't go back to mr Ware to say no that would be insensitive i was at a wedding reception and the chairman or the ceo of lasaco assurance which is an insurance company in lagos was the chairman of the wedding and i knew a man who knew him from my church so when the man, this man, CEO had police police detail, he had few people from, you know, so he stood up from his chair and I think he was going to the bathroom. I was sitting close to the bathroom. Well, I mean bathroom, a toilet, you know, it was a wedding reception. So I stood up from where I was and I followed him to the toilet. Die, Balaka. <laughs> he went in there, he finished, I finished. As we were stepping out, I just approached him. The policeman said, stop. He said, no, 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 come. I said, excuse me, sir, I'm a fifth year medical student from the University of Lagos. I was wondering if you could assist me. I've got an opportunity to go to the University of Stellenbosch in Cape Town for a, an elective program in plastic and reconstructive surgery, but I, I just can't finance it. The man just looked at me. He said, and I know a man who knows you actually in my local church. Oh, you're from that place? Yes, I am. All right. Wow. Okay, I will speak to him. So he called that man. And the man said, oh, yeah, I know him. 
so she said to me, meet me in my office the next day. That was a oh. Saturday. Do you know, I went to his office in Las in Nikeja. It's in this GRA, Keja place, Lasako Assurance. Do you know that he counted to me 100 US dollar bills? That's the first time I'd ever touched brand new. I never knew people were that wealthy in Nigeria. He, one by one, one, we paid for my trip to South Africa. A man that, do you know that a few years ago, and he didn't want to keep a relationship with me. He never, yes. after that, never kept my call, took my calls. Maybe, I'm not sure. It was when I got to Australia that I got his WhatsApp number and I sent him a text and he was very grateful that he supported me at the time. But I wanted to reach out to him, but I reckon maybe I can understand why he didn't want a long-term relationship with me at the time. But this was a man, Let me, you know what I used to call it then? I used to call it professional begging. You know, uh, there was a way I was well packaged. You know, when I wanted to go to England, I wore my suit. I had about 13 places I would go and I wear my suit. I had only one and with my bag. I was a final year medical student and I'll just knock on doors and ask. And, you know, and I, I, I understand the principle, the worst I would get is a no. And a lot of the time I got no's. A lot of the time I got no's. But one person, when I went to England, one person, you know, I bought my ticket on the day I was to travel. I just kept believing. On the day I was to travel, one person came through for me and one person said a yes. And that day I got a KLM ticket flight to England. So despite the fact I was poor and everything, I had a never say die attitude. I just believed yes. you know my Yabatek, 14 year old boy, waking up every day, believing to have a meal and we'll have yes. a meal. We go and come back. And I did that every day. I was living by faith. I wake up in the morning, I'm going to school. Where's the money? I don't know. Do you have a meal? I don't know. Do you have textbooks? I don't know. All I have was a, my notebooks and I'll step out of my heart out, out of faith. And my mom believed with me. And I'll come back at five or six o'clock and I would have had a full day of lecture and I would have had something to eat, even though maybe scraps, but I would have had something to eat and I'll come back home and I'll sleep and I'll get back. This. So that just built in me faith and courage that it was nothing impossible. Okay, and now. I knew that this life, the life I was living at the time was not the life I wanted, but I just knew, I believed that as God kept me every single day, he made ways for me. Let me tell you, if you know how many testimonies happened, if you know how many testimonies on a single day, my life was a life of daily trust and dependence on God. And he kept me yeah. through it. At the end of the year, yeah. I was wiser, I was smarter, I was better in my understanding, in my faith, and in my relationship with God. And that just okay, matured now. When it came to other things like going to the UK, approaching people, I knew. You know how I learned to approach people? I was doing that. I did your 14 at the bus stop asking for transport fare. So I could yes. now a CEO for a fair to England or to South Africa. I could not do it because I've been doing it since 14. Now I was 21. All right? And all I know now... I could not do it with poise. I cannot do it with a suit. Those days I used to do with a yeah. shirt, Tito Sandal. Now I had a shoe and a suit. And I cannot do it. And I could still connect with people and share my dreams with people. And people will still put their hands in their pocket. And that's how. So when I see myself today, like Kole Shorin, I will say that, you know what, uh, I am a, uh, you know, my life now is a contribution, you know, um, from a lot of people, you know. So I didn't just get a raise on my intelligence. Yeah. A lot of people at key stages in my yes. life. Yes. Fast forward, sorry, sorry that I'm just going here to skeleton. Fast forward to this time when my father came back and I was like, No, don't no fast forward now. <laughs> okay. Don't? Yes, yes. Don't fast yes. forward. Yes. I I'm want you to even, hold it. We probably haven't talked about the topic because I, you know, I had one We've or two comments. Yes, but, but it's okay. As God leads us, just let me, just tell me to stop whenever you want me to stop because I can, you know, this is my life story. Okay. So I like it. So I, I stood there, I was an intern. And I, my father came back. No, I don't want you to tell the Indian story yet. Yes, okay, okay, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I yeah, can hear I don't you. want you to tell the Indian story. I'm reserving it. Yes, I want yes. to take a break. Yes. Because, like I said, we want to have our big reveal yes. before Doc goes on. This, mm -hmm. like, my heart is burning. Like, I'm having to hold myself together. And mm -hmm. I can see from the comment section, guys that you are catching this role. There are too many powerful, profound insights in the middle of this life story. One of the things that is hitting me the most is how a person takes, you know, a pen and flips it to a tool for purpose. Mm -hmm. And I love when you said, look, 
I have not I had now mastered this professional begging. I mean, I would I would beg for transport fare for team with my pink shirt, uh, ink stained pink shirt and keto sandal. Now I got a shoe and a suit and I can speak better. So I, you were still using the tools that were forged in pain, right? We want to go on to the big reveal. I want to spend just a few minutes before we come back again to Dr. Nii. My mind is blown. I want to take a moment, right, to speak to you. If you're listening to me in this moment and your heart is burning because you've caught a vision, you've caught a picture of a better tomorrow, that's a vision. You've caught an idea. You've caught something that awakens you to the truth that there's something on your inside that is an answer for the world, right? If you're listening to me tonight and you know that even if you don't have it together, you still got the ink stained pink shirt and your keto sander. If that's the phase of life you still are, but there's an answer burning in your heart. There's something that you believe you carry. I tell you what, this is the true gold. Vision is the true gold. You may not have all the money. You may not have all the belief. You may not have all the support system. You may not know how it will all come together. But if you are currently pregnant, I'm speaking to you. If you are currently pregnant, God has ordained a midwife for you. We all need midwives. We need the right environment, the right knowledge, the right tools to accelerate us on the path of destiny. When a destiny decade, when in a time when the nameless, faceless, clueless, unknown, who are at the back end of nowhere, literally, are going to be transported to the front line just by the principle of faith. Faith is not what you think of it. It's not name it and claim it. It is vision. Faith is vision. Faith is the risky adventure of believing enough in what you carry that you're willing to put something on it to move it to the next level. That's faith. It's vision. It's the risky adventure of believing enough in that thing burning on your inside. So if there's any solution that is on your inside for education, healthcare, entrepreneurship, agriculture, entertainment, medicine, whatever, technology, whatever it is you're carrying today and you're saying, did you have got this idea? And let me tell you what, when you've got a vision to change the life of others, your life gets changed. I've been on the path of vision for the last decade and a half, and it has made me into who I've become. Not the smartest, not the friendliest, not the prettiest, not the wealthiest, but vision has forged the best of me and the journey is still on. And that's the journey I want to invite you on. You see, people might be fixating on make-believe, but I give it another three years. There's a big bubble that is about to burst. It's better to find your footing and latch onto your teachers and your midwives so that what is on your inside does not decay because vision is time sensitive. Vision is time sensitive. It's possible that you've heard a lot of things and you're in a place where you're just almost cynical. Everybody's just saying one thing or the other. But anytime your heart burns within you, that is a navigation tool, the authentic navigation tool within you that is alerting you that go for this. When my heart burns, I follow my heart more than my head. If your heart burns, you better let's do this together. I'm not trying to sell you a course. I'm showing you what is possible. I brought Dr. Niyi here because it's a proof that vision is a truly transformational gift that we get from God. Let me tell you the other thing that blows my mind about the time sensitivity of vision. Because God is hard pressed to change the world through humanity. God changes humanity through humanity because man is the methodology of God. Because he's hard pressed on time to create a change for the world and for humanity. What he puts in your heart is time sensitive and you are not irreplaceable. You are not indispensable. So you would notice that it looks like those who work and who have high turnaround rates with their vision, who go ahead and master execution, they keep getting results. They keep getting new ideas because God is an investor. He begins to trust those who know how to steward the vision he gives to them. Stop sitting on what you've been given. 
right? And getting results is not copy and paste. It's really working with teachers ordained for you, mentors, midwives, who can help you release it. And that's what Visionary Compass is about, right? That's what it's about. 40 weeks, I stay with you. I go on that journey with you. When you come out at the end of it, what you become will keep speaking for the years ahead, for the decades ahead. It's about legacy. That's the journey we are on, right? And I want to just challenge you to look beyond your limitations, look beyond your excuses, look beyond your fears, look beyond your money, money mindset challenges and make a determination that this, if it burns in your heart, I want to challenge you to go for it. I'm going to show you a few um, testimonials, right? That I want you to look at. This is Yagazi. Yagazi says, since working with DDK and using some of the strategies she shared with me, I've been able to relaunch my profitable photography business program with a lot more students on board. She's shown me how to thrive through systems, connecting with different people and becoming aware of my limitless potentiality. DDK is patient, attentive, thorough, and has a very systematic approach to problem solving, right? I want to show you what Bisola Kuku says. Bisola Kuku is a business planner in an upstream oil and gas company. She says, as a coach, DDK shows you what is possible, why it is possible, and how you can actually make it happen. What makes her absolutely unique is because she shares from the depth of her own journey and experiences, as well as breaks everything down in such a way that life hits you. I'm going to take just one more, right? Abisola Richard Obama says, DDK is in a class of her own. The way she effectively and graciously utilizes humor and down-to-earth methodologies to teach life-changing and mind-shifting concepts is second to none. And here's the big reveal, guys. I want you to get on Visionary Compass. With all my heart, I want you to get on it. I want you to make this the beginning of beginnings for yourself. It's, it's the game changer. We're together 40 weeks, three trimesters, eight core modules. I'm going to show you what I feel like is the biggest gift in the program, right? And it's my visionary, it's, it's my execution blueprint. I give you an execution blueprint, 40 weeks. I show you what you need to do, whether you are the launch stage, the clarify stage, the growth stage, or the scale stage. It's MBA grade stuff, no fluff, I'm telling you. When you come out, you will master both the visionary success side of things, you master the execution side of things. You will be hot, hot. Let me tell you why it's important. People think that all they have to say is, oh God, use me, just make me significant in my generation. I want to solve problems, I want to create change, but that's not how it works. Notice that the one who had two, you know, and multiplied it, the one who had five and multiplied it, when it, the one who had one lost his talent, it was given to the one with five. If you do simple mathematics, you will be like, if the person who had five multiplied and made it 10, and somebody else, else has two, multiplied it and made it four, who should have been given? You'd be like, what is fair is you give the guy who has four so he can have five. But if you give the guy who has four and he has five, if it multiplies it, it becomes 10. If you give the guy who has 10 and it becomes 11, if he multiplies it, it becomes 22. God is an investor. So in the year and the decade of the visionary, here's the secret. You must become the person who has capacity to radically multiply and improve on what you have been given. Whenever God finds visionaries who can run quick, and that takes practice, it takes schooling, it takes adventure, it takes faith, it takes mastery, right? The moment you become that person, they'll be dropping stuff on you. And when you create value at greater levels, you're going to walk in wealth that becomes transgenerational. I'm going to be bringing uh, Dr. Nee back on, and I want us to get into that internship experience. But today, I'm giving you up until Friday, 20% off completely, right? 
20% off, all you have to do is use the code 20 off when you get to myvisionarycompass.com. I don't take stories. I don't, I don't take scorpions, beggings when the doors close, right? So you want to take quick action. If you want to ask questions, you want clarity, I'm going to set up a private call for those who are interested and I'll share the link with you. I'm happy to help you make the decision easier. But I'm telling you, I'm on a journey with high growth visionaries this year and I'm going to be literally replicating my best with the best of the visionaries. That's the work I've been giving. And I'm taking this to different parts of Africa in the course of this first year. And then we go out of the continent in the second year. But in this first year, I'm working actively with Africans in Africa and Africans around the world because the light that is required to quench or to shift the darkness on this continent has to really shine bright. Okay, so when you're done today, you want to head down to myvisionarycompass.com and you'll be able to get into our 40 week accelerator program. No fluff MBA great stuff that is going to shift you into legacy leadership this year and this decade. You deserve a place and at the front lines. And Dr. Nee is starting to show us that it's got nothing to do with your background, but everything to do with the kind of person you are becoming. And you need a midwife to steward that journey, okay? We are getting back on with Dr. Nii. And let me know if you need any kind of support. Uh, we're going to take a few questions about the Visionary Compass before we leave today. And I'm here for you, completely here for you. Welcome back, Dr. Nii. Yay, yay. <laughs> uh, I'm, so glad, I'm so glad that you have me here. And I want to thank you for what you do and for the opportunities that you, you know, you're providing here. And I hope that everyone watching will take, um, will, will give this a very deep thought uh, and consider joining this program because I believe, you know, I've just been on the website actually. That was what I was doing. Just so I've been there, just checking it out. You know, looks very good, well put together and very detailed. Yes, sir. I think it's worth the investment. You cannot actually grow if you don't if mm. you're not intentional about your investment. And, and mm. I see that, that would. You know, so it has my highest recommendation. Absolutely. Thank you, and thank you for being a part of Unbundling 2020 as well. Yes, when I yes. saw when I saw you buy it, I'm like, it's crazy. What is he even doing, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was just so keen, so so keen. Although later I was getting a lot of women stuff, and I was like, so okay, you're like, well, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, just take me out of that one. Keep me in Unbundling, and I'm yes. also excited about our own coaching relationship and what we yes. want to do together. So yes. for sure, um, yes. I'm, I'm waiting to see how we take it to the next level. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'll be glad. All right, so um, yeah, I was going to share the, the experience I had as an intern. Um, so as I said, um, I had put a lot of money together. Most of my income had been saved in shares and um, I, I'd been saved in the bank and I had a few shares at the time. So, but my, my father became very sick, and apparently he, he had been diabetic for a long time. We didn't know anything about it, but he had a wound that would not heal. So he was admitted. I went home actually one day, and I saw him with a wound on his leg, and I said, Dad, you know, we have to go to the hospital. I took him to the hospital, and uh, we found that he had no blood flow to the leg. He had what we call peripheral disease, which is when the blood the arteries and the legs get clogged up. It's very common in diabetes. You probably would know that diabetes is the commonest cause of non-traumatic amputation. So a lot of people get amputated and have amputated limbs from diabetes much more than any other disease apart from road traffic accidents. So um, we, the leg became gangrenous and it had to be amputated. So it's, wow. Yeah, so he, he had an amputation and unfortunately, the wound broke down. Of course, infection control is very poor. Nursing care is very poor. He became very sick. He had, you know, bed ulcers everywhere. Even though he was a patient in the same ward where I was working, which was also very embarrassing and traumatic. We couldn't afford a private wing of the hospital. And I felt being in a public hospital was better because he required so many operations. And most of the specialists were there anyway. Yeah, but, well, you know, he just became very sick. All our money was spent. Every single cent was spent. Um, and all I had left was what I bought in shares at Diamond Bank. 
um, and a few other shares that I had, um, which I just left. I felt, okay, I was gonna travel to Australia, so I keep all of this. Um, but unfortunately, you know, on the 2nd of November, I was, um, at that time I was pastoring the U Church now, in our, in our church, I was pastoring the U Church. So I got up that morning, uh, I was gonna preach in church, you know, and I just wanted to go to the ward to say bye-bye to him that I'm going to church on the back because I was living on campus in Luth. Um, so, but I'll travel down to church and I'll come back. You know, I got there and I, I, I was told he had passed away overnight. Wow. Yeah, so he had died. Um, so I went to his bed, you know, lifted up the, the blanket and saw him. He was 61 when he passed away. Um, you know, and I went to church. I didn't even tell anyone. I didn't, I just told them not to tell anyone. So I went to church, did my thing after the service. I came home and um, I I told them and it was very devastating, um, you know, at the time. And so, you know, we went through all of that. It was difficult. We had we were in debt, so much debt that, you know, the hospital refused to release my father's body. Wow. Yes. And yeah, I was I was a doctor at the same hospital. So I went to the head of pathology, the former head of pathology, who used to be a professor. And I and I told him that listen, I had a distinction in pathology and morbid anatomy. I had a distinction. And that, you know, and he remembered me because I was the best student in that course. And uh, I said, listen, this is what has happened, you know. So he wrote me a letter. So and then I took that letter to to the to the hospital and then they said okay yes it's one of our staff so they they wrote off that time close to a million naira was what was going so they wrote that off um this was 2008 so they wrote it off and then they released my father's body mm. um, um so we we got we got that done so you see all of that experience and that was just the week my father died was the week i paid for my australian exam you know, and mm. after that, I knew God wanted me to. I'm not going to go into the Australian story in the stress of time, so we can talk about other things. But that my father died on a Sunday, and I paid for my Australian exam to travel to Australia on a Tuesday. The money I used was the money that I was supposed to um, pay to the hospital for my father's surgery. It was now up to about 100 and something thousand. I had borrowed it. So I borrowed the money uh, the week before to pay for an operation, which he was supposed to have. So I just felt, you know what? <laughs> Let me just empty my account and just do this. So I took what was left in my account with that money and I paid for my Australian exam straight away. And I'm glad I did it, otherwise I would not have. And um and um here I am today, you know, that same after my father died, you know, I just um you know got the visa to travel down here and I even go here. Let me just let me mention this and then I will sort of pivot on the topic which is triumphing through vision or you know and how your purpose can be stronger than your pain. You know, that was the lowest point of my life at the time, you know, where my father yes. just, and we never really got along. The first time I heard my father say, I love you was on his deathbed, you know? Wow. So this, this was a man that we really never got along, to be honest. And I felt that a lot of the issues we had, I thought he just, at the time I actually felt a lot of anger towards him. I felt a lot of anger towards him. I just wasn't happy with him. And in fact, if you read my book, you will see some of the encounters I had. Some of the, we, we had fights, you know, when I was in university, my father and I, he angered me enough. In fact, my son, who is now 10, was reading my book and I, we made him read the book. And he, he asked, he was like amazed that I had a, you know, physical altercation with my dad. Of course, he was, I was reacting to him. He, you know, he, he attacked me and I just got angry and I lost it. Of course, which I see with a sense of regret. Uh, but that was the thing. I never really liked him. I never, because I felt that you left me, left all of us when I was a teenager, just like, you know, 13, 14, to meet another woman and left my mom and we in abject poverty with no income. I just, I felt pained, felt pained. And I want to confirm from the audience if I'm the only one, but I feel like I'm struggling to hear now. Okay. Please let me know in the comment section. Am I the, am I, could he be on my side? Can you hear Dr. Nee clearly? Let me know, can you hear Dr. Nee clearly? Although I can see you, I couldn't see you at the time, but I can see you now, so maybe it's great. Okay, yes, you can hear clearly. Okay, fantastic, they okay. can hear you. Super. 
Yes. Okay, yes. okay, whatever. So I'll probably raise my voice. You know, it was just probably the sensitivity around that. That's probably why I was yes. talking with a low tone. So yeah, so that was, you know, I was pained at the time and there was no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that when he came back, we still couldn't get along and then he became very sick. And then I had this sick. huge burden. And then all my aspirations of traveling to Australia with my own money, self-financed, was dashed yes. with himself. So everything I had was spent on him. And then the global financial crisis happened. And I remember going to my stockbroker saying, you know what, I want to travel, I want to sell my shares. And he told me that all I left was now 40,000. That was the worth of what? my shares. It was less than 10% less than of what I had invested. So pretty much the GFC wiped out everything I had. I had, in fact, the first, share, first set of shares I bought was three months salary, which was those days our salary was about 130, 150,000. So, you know, I had about, I'm sure maybe close to half a million Naira invested and yeah, it was telling me it was less than 40,000. You know, I was what? in tears and that was just after my father yes. died. He, do you know what? He gave me a check of 50,000 Naira there and then when he saw me, the stockbroker gave me 50,000 Naira. He felt so bad for me, you know, yes. at the time because I was just broken. I was really broken. I, I just felt, God, can't I just have a break? Why is life? I used to feel that, why is life so hard for me? I've had, I had life. Now I was 22, 23 from the age of 14. You know, I'd had to be the man of the house. I had had to be the person in charge. I had had to support my mom. At that time, I had, I had paid my, my, my fees. I was paying the fees of my younger ones, of my older sister. I just grown up too quick, you know, mm. so my life was just, I was just miserable. I would cry. I would pray and I would say, God, why? Why this situation? Why am I in this kind of, I was hurt. And then when the man came back, he was sick and wiped, everything I had was wiped out. But do you know what? When I knew I was going to come to Australia and I booked, um, paid for my exams, I couldn't afford the fees. And unfortunately, Mr. Wei and I, we were still in touch, but throughout the time when that stressful period when my father was sick, we just, it was just unavailable. I would try reaching him, it was difficult to get, you know? And at that time, of course, I, well, I was on my own financially at the time. So, and when my father died, I sent him a message, no reply, no response. Throughout the death and the burial. So I felt really hurt by him. Mm. I felt that, okay, yeah, we're closer than this, not a word. But, you know, things happen for a reason. Do you know, sometime in January, a few weeks before my exam, I'd given up on the exam at the time or almost given up because I had a visa, I had everything, but I couldn't fly to Australia. I couldn't afford it. So he rang me and said, me, wow, I don't know what happened. I can't even remember his excuse, but he was so sorry on the phone. So, so sorry. And we, I said, yes, what, what, what will I do? I said, yes, I said, yes, I was open to him. I said, and then he said, okay. So I used to travel, <laughs> traveling where I said, I'm not traveling to Australia anymore. He said, no, they're going. Oh. The next day he sent me the biggest, or the largest sum of money anyone had ever given me in my life. My God. He paid for me my flight ticket, he sent it to me. I got the alert, I couldn't believe it. I got the alert, I couldn't believe it. Almost half a million he sent to me the next day. And I hear how I was from, you know, God knew that this man was gonna be, I don't know how it happened, how God, maybe God kept him from talking to me so God can, he, he could make that emotional decision of flying me yes. down. Yes, yes. While I was angry and I was feeling so sad that this man had let me down. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, and thank God I didn't lash out at him and all that because of the relationship. I didn't lash out at him or try to ignore his call. When he called, I picked the call. But thank God I picked that call. And this man exactly. picked Exactly. Thank Australia. God you were not too angry to pick the call. No, no. You know, he paid for my flight to Australia and here I am now. I came to this country on a three months tourist visa with a $500 loan from some of my roommates. And here I am today in this country, an Australian citizen. I got married here, all right? Our, our wedding was in Newcastle in Australia. Married now for, this will be our 12th year, okay, of marriage. 
with two lovely kids and where I am today. But you can see the journey was a very rough one. Yes. And, and so when you ask me that initial question, which has led to all of this, why do I feel grounded? Or why do I feel level-headed and humbled? It's because of my journey. It's because mm. I know that, you know, every step of the way, I had to learn to live by faith. Yes. And every step of the way, you know, I have, and maybe later I'll tell you my journey in Australia, you'll be amazed. In fact, how I got to stay from a tourist visa, how I got my break and I got a job. And you know what? I only had one year experience. Can you imagine? Mm. One year working experience in a third world country. And how did I get into a residency training program in Australia with one year working experience where all I knew was malaria and tuberculosis and typhoid? All right. And how did I get into? Yes, that's all I knew. You know, how did I get into this country? And how I was able to, you know, I'm only one of two black neurologists in the whole of this country. How did I get, yes, I'm just one of two. The only two black neurologists in the whole of Australia and New Zealand. How did I get into this? How did I get to start my own business? And how did I get to, you know, so I think a lot of that. Now, let me just pivot on one or two things that I'd mentioned um, that I'd written down here when it comes to um, triumphing through vision and getting your purpose, you know, how you can make your purpose stronger than your pain. Yes. You know, and, you know, I guess what I, when I thought about this last night, I was just reflecting on this, that what, you know, um, you know, purpose versus pain and how, how do we just, and I'm going to bring some sort of neuroscience into this, into just looking at purpose and pain and, you know, the different factors at play here. In my own understanding, um, the actual fact is that our purpose is actually stronger than our, the pains we go through. That's the reality. Mm. So it's a, it's a matter of perception. Many times when we're in pain, it looks like the pain is stronger or the pain is bigger. Mm. Than we your perception is usually altered by your experience. The reality of a perception is a perception is stimulus dependent. Perception depends on your sensory experience. So a lot of us perceive things based on contact and exposure and experience. But the reality is that, well, I'm using the word reality over and over again because your perception is your reality at that time. And your, your perception may not be accurate, but your perception is your reality. Mm. Okay. Have you ever wondered that if you want to buy a car, you suddenly start seeing the car everywhere? Well, the yes, car's sir. always it's just a matter of perception. Your brain becomes, because you've focused on that idea, your perception enhances. So there's a selective process. So there are a lot of things in the background, really. For example, you may be watching me right now. You see a photo to my right there, a photo of my family. Some of you might not have seen it until now. I'm pointing at my thumb to it right now. Some of you might not have seen a, that photo of my family up until now. But you've been watching this for over one hour, all right? That's perception. Why? Because you're engaged with me and you're not looking at the background. There are a lot of things that happen in the background that, you know, um, in our lives that we, we that are important, but we don't focus on, we don't see the bigger picture because we're just narrowed in our thinking mm. and our, in our vision. Yes. All right. Uh, and so that's what pain does. Pain narrows your vision or narrows your hey. pain. Pain actually closes you in. Pain makes you very myopic in your view and your understanding of the world. <sighs> A lot of things that are supposed to, you know, sometimes it's good to step back and just see the bigger picture, but pain doesn't do that. It's just like when you're flying, and I think I heard it from somewhere, I can't remember where I heard it from now. It's just like when you're flying in a, a, a plane, and you know, most of us have not been flying now for over a year due to the pandemic. But I remember I used to fly quite a lot. And when you're about 30,000 feet in the air, everything on, 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 on ground looks very small, all right? You have that bird's eye view, and you can see everything yeah. looks very small. Even the big mountains look so microscopic. But as you come closer, as you come closer, everything looks bigger and bigger and bigger. The reality is that when you're, you know, when you're close to mountains and you're close to all these, you know, horrible, painful experiences, they look bigger than they really are. And at, at times we just have to step a bit back and look at the bigger picture mm -hmm. and realize that it's just a spot in the whole sort of grand scheme of things and God's grand plan. And that's, of course, where purpose comes in. So I think the first thing is actually having the right perception of life and on this, because if you don't have the right perception, you would misinterpret your pain and you would actually develop a negative mindset and attitude about the experience you're going through. And that's what I've learned, that every single situation and experience 
I've gone through. Of course, when I was living through the pain, I didn't see purpose in it. I didn't see what God was doing in me. But from my experience already that I've shared, you would have seen that some of the disappointments, like the last one I shared, the fact that I was disappointed that a man that was close to me for five, six years in the most, in the lowest point of my life left me alone, where I thought I needed him more, where I thought, you know, I needed him. I'd lost all my money. I'd lost all my savings. I'd lost my dad. I couldn't even afford to buy a casket for my dad. If you see the kind of burial my father had, he had a very ordinary burial. Mm. Do you know I spent, I didn't have a single cent for his burial. Yes. Was people that just contributed from the village that did a very shabby kind of burial for him. And if I was when I got to Australia that I went back to the burial ground to do marble and to do all of those things, it was an unmarked grave. Wow. And that hurt me. So I was in a piece in a place of hurt that I was a doctor and I just couldn't afford anything. I was a doctor and going home, I'll still take my mole away, you know, because I had nothing. All my savings had been gone to this man who was not there to even pay for my school fees. Yes. That was hurt me. That hurt me that he wasn't there, he didn't pay for my school fees. And then he's coming here and he's wiped away all my dreams. Wow. Four months ago, I was thinking of Australia, and now I'm spending all my money savings on him. That hurt me. And there were times at that time that I felt, God, why did you do this? Why, 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 God? You know? But of course, now I look at the bigger picture and I see that God was doing something behind the scene. And I was ob oblivious to it. And I think that's what pain does. Pain changes your perception. Pain alters your perception. And that pain, and that perception may not be accurate, but is the reality at the time. And, uh, and that's one very important point I would uh, mention. The, the, the other point I wanted to mention here, and this is, uh, and I'll stop after this point, is that uh, whenever you're about to start anything new, there are three new systems, and this is very neuroscientific, but I thought I'd bring in neuroscience after all. Why did I go to medical school? So sorry, uh -huh. did chip this in. Oh, hey. God. <laughs> so you've got you've got the focus system you've got the stress system and you've got the reward system and i'm just going to talk about these three systems and how they help with purpose and pain all right so every time you want to start a new project and for some of you here who are visionaries you'll be going on this journey with ddk all right immediately you have a new idea that you want to start something new all right your focus system is activated this focus system is um mediated by a hormone called acetylcholine you don't need to remember the name but what it does is that there's a small nucleus in your yeah, brain I, called the nucleus. I can't remember it. It's not you don't need to remember. I cannot remember. <laughs> remember <Okay. what? laughs> so, so your brain, your brain produces a hormone called acetylcholine. This um, hormone helps to direct the focus of your attention. This, the, it's the same hormone that is depleted in Alzheimer's dementia. That's why people with Alzheimer's dementia can't remember things. They can't focus. They're very distractible. All right. So this hormone actually causes your brain to focus on that idea. Okay, so that's the focus system. Yeah, thank you for putting that up as a tackle in. So when, you're, when your brain is, when you're like, okay, I want to start a new project, I want to start a new thing, your brain releases this hormone and you, it directs the focus of your attention to that project. That's the focus system, okay? Now, at the same time, there's another system in your body that is activated called the stress system. And this is mediated by cortisol and adrenaline. Now, the aim of this is to get you pumped up and alert for your activity. So let's assume, imagine yourself, just imagine yourself now, you're on the start line of a 100 meter race, Olympic final, which will happen in Japan, you know, in a few months time. The Olympics, you are there, final, 100 meters, all right? Next to you are the world champions and everything. How do you think you would feel, all right? Your your brain will be full of acetylcholine because you'll be focused. I want to yes. get a gold. You'll be shaking, yes. you'll be shaking because of stress and cortisol and adrenaline. You'll be like, oh, imagine, you know, just you being, you're about to deliver a speech to the UN. You know how you feel. Even yes. you're focused, and then you're, you know, that's the stress system. You're alert. Okay. You're, you're not going to be distracted. You know, your, your focus, your brain is so focused on the task that you will not even notice that some of your friends may be there. You may not even see your parents. You may not see anyone. You're just focused on what you're doing. And then your stress system is activated. Your heart starts to pound because of adrenaline. Your leg, your palms are clammy and sweaty and you're just pumped up. That's the stress system. The stress system is meant to get you alert, get you pumped up for the activity. All right. Now, the problem is that a lot of us rely on the stress system to get us through. The problem is that the stress system also enhances pain. All right. Mm. It also enhances pain. And we, know, we now know that people quit because of the stress system. The hormone that makes us quit when we start let's assume you started a weight loss journey you're more likely to quit because you're relying on your stress system the stress system is meant to help you to get you going 
is, is meant to kickstart your journey, not to keep you through the journey. Mm. Your stress, stress system. Stress is meant to kickstart us, to get you up, stand up, get a lot, get moving. But to sustain that race, you need a lot more than your stress system. Okay. Um, and our pain, pain is connected to our stress system. So for me, the pain of poverty, the pain of lack, the pain of looking, my, my younger brother couldn't go to school for two years because we couldn't afford the school fees. This was in secondary school. For two years, not even in government secondary school, we could not afford to pay the basic fees for government public school. This boy stayed, today is a, is a graduate of economics from a university in Europe. For two mm. years, he was home. Okay. That pain, all of that, of course, created stress in me and pushed me around. Yes. But you know what? A lot of us quit because we rely on pain. We rely on the stress. We rely on the, you know, oh, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to do this. I don't. That's not enough for a visionary. That's Ooh. where the reward system comes in. The reward system is mediated by dopamine. The reward system is the system that a visionary should rely on. Because mm -hmm. the reward system, actually, every time you achieve your goal, you have a release of dopamine in your brain. Every time you pass an exam, you get a release of dopamine. Anytime you achieve a spiritual goal, maybe you, want, you read the Bible in a year and you're successfully completed or you mentor somebody and you see the transformation in their lives, there's a part of your brain that is activated and you have a release of dopamine which gives you pleasure, which gives you a sense of fulfillment. All right, and that's the reward system. But do you know that you can actually release dopamine in your brain and activate those networks by actually just thinking about the goal, even if you've not achieved the goal? So just staying at the start line. Do you know you can flood your brain with dopamine at the start of the race by picturing where you're going, the finish line, and seeing yourself crossing that line and releasing enough dopamine? Because you know what? Dopamine counteracts stress. Dopamine will calm down the stress hormones and everything. They work in, you know, every time you're running on adrenaline, you're not going to see the finish line. Mm. I, ran, I ran up with this story of this woman, Florence Chadwick, who was a one of the first women to swim the English Channel from England to France. Florence Chadwick wanted to do what no woman had ever done. She got into the water, high sea cold water of the English Channel, and she was swimming and swimming. There was a boat next to her with her mom and a physician and a few mates. And they kept pushing her, go, go, Florence, go, Florence. But if you, but she just felt the pain. She said, she said the cold was like daggers piercing through her skin as she was swimming kilometers through the English Channel. Then she gave up. When she got out of the boat, she said, I don't think any woman can ever do this. No woman can do this. This is for men. She got out of the water, and when she got out of the water, she realized she was just a few meters away from the finish line. When she was there, she said, why did you give up? She said, I couldn't see the finish line. It was wow. all fog. It was a foggy morning, so she had no vision of the finish line. The people in the boat said, we're almost there, you're almost there, but she couldn't believe that, them. Because ah, I was almost there, like, you know, one kilometer I go, and you're telling me I'm almost there. She felt they were just, you know, what she felt, you know, oh, yeah. She felt she, they were deceiving her. But she, so for her, it was just stress. Everything was stress. It was adrenaline that was pushing her and pushing her. But she couldn't see the finish line. So she got out. Do you know the next time she said, I'm going to do this again? She Before she went to the race, she started from the finish line. She looked at it. She created a mental picture. Someone said, it's only the future that you can picture that you would feature. You know? You know, she went there and she pictured the goal. She pictured where she was going. She had that clear vision, well imprinted in her mind. So she went back and she swam this time. And every time her hands felt very heavy with every stroke, she was able to push through because she was now releasing dopamine. She was seeing the end from the beginning. And every stroke was a stroke that wasn't just based on stress, was a stroke that was based on a determination to go to achieve a goal. She kept mm. pushing, she kept pushing. She felt the same pain. She felt the same stress. She felt the same, you know, the, the same coldness, but she never gave up now. She never stood out of the water. She went to the end and became the first woman ever to swim across the English Channel. And she repeated it over and over again and opened up the door for many male women to do that. Now that channel is something that and even children now have done it, all right? But she was the first woman to ever do it. But she had to have that picture. She had to look at the future and picture it. And that's something I'll encourage you to do. When I was in Yaba College of Technology, I went to a public secondary school. I could not speak grammar. I was so shy with my words. I couldn't speak. 
But every day I pictured myself that one day I'd stand before hundreds of people. I would picture myself do that and speak. And I would, and I saw myself doing that. And you know, every time you think about that and you picture that, you create neuronal pathways in your brain yes. that will actually help you. Oh God, I'm already preaching now. But I, I hope you get my point. So the focus system, the stress system, and the reward system. What you want to enhance as a leader, all right, is... And, and as a uh, as a visionary, you know, and this is something that I've been working on. I'm working on the neuroscience of leadership, training leaders to uh, improve their efficacy, their efficiency, their productivity with, you know, neuroscientific principles. And that's certainly something that I think a lot of people struggle with when you focus on the now. And this is actually faith based. There's a there's a science to faith, and a lot of people don't even understand this as well. When you focus on your goal and your vision, you release positive chemicals that enhance your brain's productivity you reduce your stress levels and you can then move on i'll stop there wow <laughs> excuse me please who are you what <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. let me take a moment to also celebrate dr sam ekundayo he is in the building. He is our mutual friend and brother. I met Dr. Yeah. Niyi through Dr. Sam. And you're yeah. going to be hearing from Dr. Sam, from Dr. Niyi, when you join the Visionary Compass, because they are part of our expert mentor faculty. And you know you know how this rolls. Like, if this was just a tip of the iceberg, how does the iceberg look? What? Mm. What? Guys, I want you to give it to me tonight. Can you tell me your biggest light bulb moments as you listen to Dr. Nii Boriri? Let me know, like, describe what you're feeling and describe in your words what this night epitomizes for you if you're on the WAT side of it's morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Yes, Dr. Samuel says, iceberg, too bad. <laughs> wow. Wow, people aren't finding their words here. They're like, wow, wow, say what? So I want you to please find your words. I can see a lot of fire emoji. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, Mick Peter says, no barrier. That's what jumps out at you from tonight's session that is, there are no barriers. Demi says, there's, there is a science to faith that jumps out at her. Okay. I love it. Someone says, your resilience, it's compelling. Yetune says, I have a good headache. <laughs> okay. Give it to me, Amaka, try. Amaka says, I cannot choose, but I want you to make an attempt. What stands out for you? Olushaye, mothers arising, says, I can't focus on the pain. It can't carry me to the finish line. I must focus on the future I want. So good. Absolutely. Marianne says, my chest is actually aching. I know my heart has been burning listening mm. to Dr. Nee. Adeshola Adish, Adibwale says, Having to wait every day with no money and food, and God always showed up. What a faith. Yes. Uluatosin says it is only in the future that you can picture that you will feature. So good. Edith says the science of vision. I love it. Busaya is still in shock. Please, ushers, help her. She's still in shock. <laughs> Kennedy says, I feel so weak with all the stuff I've heard tonight. I'm determined to flood my brain with dopamine always. Vision is faith, a risky venture, says Dr. Samuel Epindaya. Uh, Adil Miojoy says, the future, a picture is the one I can feature in, is a light bulb moment for her. I love it. No. Uh, Jadisola says, adrenaline can sustain you. Keep dreaming of the finish line. It will sustain you. Uh, Olushe says, possibility only, just focus that will stress us complete with reward. Good job. Your journey is valid. Your journey is God. Your journey is the key. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those says, light bulb moment. You mean light bulb destiny. <laughs> I love it. So good. Mr. Aware, his obedience to God by being generous to Dr. Lee has created this success story today. Only God knows the far reaching impact my obedience will have. Exactly. This is a big, big takeaway for me. It, it has strengthened me to continue a life of giving, faith, resilience, service, courage. Nene says, I must have a never say die attitude. Wow. Please, Osha's help, Anne. She says this one has restricted airflow. Please, 
have <laughs> airflow, please. Mm. Ogetai was says his degree of resilience is amazing. See the finish line at all costs. This is so good. Before I, I, I read a bit more, uh, you know, when you started to actually speak about the finish line, I was almost screaming because as we worked through the curriculum for the visionary compass, uh, you know, there are four key pillars of visionary success, and it's around the uh, the vision source, the vision itself, the visionary, and the vision scape, i.e. the context uh, in which it thrives and serves the world and all of that. And when we were on the visionary, I really found myself walking through what really helps a person become a visionary. You know, that you have an idea doesn't yet make you a visionary. What makes you to a visionary is sharpened perception that keeps you in the flow of light. The ability to always, you know, because we are a multi-realmed individual. We are multi-realm beings. We are navigating both the realm of men and the realm of God. And that's not religion, that's spirituality. Every being is spiritual. Yes. And vision is when the, the gateways of the realms of God open up and you see what is happening there. Yes. You see what could be. That's it. Yes. So I started to say to myself, I am going to invest in helping people create an architecture within their souls that permanently makes you see, that yes. puts you in the seeing lane every day, every time. Because that in itself is going to be a huge endowment for the future. It's those who see tomorrow first that are going to be able to birth it. And they will always be the first comma advantage. Yes. And that's yeah. precious. Yes. Yeah. yeah, look at you. One of two black neurologists. See how that sounds. Mm -hmm. I almost want to go and study medicine, but it's <laughs> too late. <laughs> no, it's not too late. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me just, let me just put this out there because of what you said. And it's a shout yes. out to my wife. Do you know? And I'm just going to give you those nuggets, okay? Because I've told I'm pushing her to write her story, and I hope she writes a story. She will. Right. Yeah, I fell in love with a lady. If you go on my Facebook page, um, you'll see some of those old pictures. She has very, very prominent bow legs. Fell in love with a lady with bow legs. All right, and she was a, a twin. She went to Lagos State University. She did a, a degree program there where. They didn't give her a certificate. You know all those kind of degree programs that you do when you don't go through jam. She did jam at uh, UME, the university matriculation exam, four times without passing. So she went through this program that was supposed to be done by the university. Apparently, it was a scam because up till today, that university hasn't given her a certificate. Yes. And then she came down here, but I still we still got together. And a lot of people ask me, are you crazy? You're marrying a bow-legged lady who doesn't even have a university degree. Because pretty much she spent seven years in Lasso with no degree. But I knew that was what I wanted for me. Do you know, we got here. She said she wanted to study law, but then she studied international relations and she did a bit of French and blah, blah, blah. But we couldn't afford law when I, we got, when I, when she joined me in Australia. You know, we got married here. Yeah, she joined me, we got married. And then I said, you know, because my life is migratory as a junior doctor, I was going from place to place. Would you consider nursing just so that we can because with nursing you can get jobs and all that and i didn't want her to stay home so i went to the bank and i got a credit card this was in 2009 2009 i got a credit card uh, our school fees was twenty one thousand dollars a year so i know the first seven thousand deposit for the school fees i paid on my credit card and we got her into nursing she'd never done science before we had to define at home and i was you know she would never allow me to teach you know husband wife teaching local area we we'll always fight so i got a friend of mine to teach her science she had a distinction in science that that term that semester she finished a degree in nursing she fell in love with nursing not only did she fall in love with nursing she went to do a master's degree in acute stroke management today, to, yes today she works in a teaching hospital as a specialist a nurse specialist when it comes to caring for stroke patients. Of course, I'm a neurologist, so we, we deal, both of us, we deal with the brain. After that, you know, that, that, that was a third degree. Last year, she walked up to me and said, you know what, I'd always wanted to be a lawyer, back to school. So my wife will be 40 next year. 
give it to them. And she's a first. She's, she's a first year law student. She just finished her first semester. Wow. First year law student, University of Sydney Law. The law she applied for in 1998, 1999 in Lasso, oh where she failed. Now she's doing that same law as a married woman after two degrees, after a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in science. She's now doing that law as a pastor's wife with two boys, with a 10-year-old son and a four-year-old son. She's doing a master, she's now doing a degree in law. So it's not too late to start. Ah, thank you for the inspiration, but I'm not having interest in, in science and medicine, so I appreciate you. For well, what? <laughs> yeah, still oh, guys, Yeah, that was, what is, who are these guys? Shout out to Mrs. Yemi Boriri. We love you, honor you, admire you. You are, I mean, you are now like the part two of the book um, <laughs> that you have to release by yourself. Yeah, Let's see yeah. a few more of the comments here. So inspiring, so many things, just so many things. Obedience saves lives. From Mr. Westside, um, this Yetunde says she's learning. Don't sit on your ideas and your vision. Uh, Yukira says your story is like mine. So if you can make it through it mm. all through, uh, if you make it all through with vision, then I'm drawing a new picture. So mm. good. The past doesn't have the final say says Mutupe, this is beautiful. Nothing is impossible. Faith is vision. Wow. Mm -hmm. Juliana says, your professional begging system was phenomenal. I caught your willfulness, sir. I love it. Nene says, wealth can be fleeting, but I must keep my faith grounded in God. Mm -hmm. Okay, Taiwo says, remaining faithful, even when you have nothing, you had nothing going for you. That hit her so much. Olubumi says, spending your savings on your dad at the expense of your dreams, that's pure love and a forgiving spirit. Yes, that stood out for me a lot as well. Mm -hmm. And it just says it's important to see the finish line right from the beginning. And I could go on and on. Sharon, yeah. the impact and influence on one, of one person on a whole family. I'm sure he did not know he was helping a whole family by yes. his generosity. So beautiful, so beautiful. It all says keep serving. God will meet you there. Get up, show up every day. Showed up in school. And then resilience and diligence. Wow. Louis says, seeing tomorrow first. Polukemi says, can we talk about forgiveness? Having to pay his father's bill after all that happened, even at the risk of his Australian dream. Yes, yes. And on and on and on and on. Now people start to, you know, gush on Mrs. Bori, my kind of woman, went back to oh, all things are possible. Sister Olaya is amazing. Wow. This is fresh. Sam, shout out to you, Dr. Sam. Dr. Sam, we love you. Thank you so much. Tom Bright, yes, maybe it's time to go back to school to study architecture. Very, very inspiring. We are able to take a question or two tonight. One of the questions that was asked way up when I was making the big reveal, and I'm going to give it to you again, just so that as you step out of here, you're going to make a big decision. Someone has asked, is every woman a visionary, right? Uh, a visionary is a state of being and it's more about who you are than what you do first so it's not like uh, being a career person or being an entrepreneur it's a state of being and to be a visionary is to allow yourself latch onto uh, uh, the vision or the picture of a future that is better and bigger than where you are and for which you are willing to participate as a co-creator with god to birth and I know that sounds like everything just dancing here and there. <laughs> but the general idea is you, you get invited on the visionary lane. The moment you recognize, number one, there is more to me than all I have experienced, right? And number two, when you say, I'm willing to participate and co-create a future possibility that is better than my today. Number three, when you say my endowments, my giftings, and my natural excellence were given to me by God, not just for me, but to, to promote the project called humanity. God is constantly promoting his desires over the project called humanity. And man is his methodology. Man has legitimate access on the realm of the earth. And that's how you get to become a partner with him. And you say, what's on your heart? Let's do it together, right? And then 
you get on the visionary path the moment you start to say i am worth the investment this one i usually find it to be the game changer people have ideas dreams desires but often do not do what it takes to step into those possibilities yeah so you're worth the investment whatever it's going to take if, you, if your heart burns and i always say this let your heart be a navigation tool because that is what it is it's a navigation system when your heart burns toward a thing toward a person toward a teacher toward an experience and is highlighted to you you latch onto it because that's an inner navigation tool saying hey go for this you never know where it's going to lead you okay so i'll take one or two more questions i i can keep dr me here for another five hours if you leave me <laughs> But we have to go. Yes, we have to. Right. He has been generous to us, and we're so grateful. Okay, if you want to uh, take, if you want him to take a question that hasn't been answered, I've had like a million questions. They've all been answered, exaggerating, but like I've had a lot of questions tonight that he's spoken to. But if there's anything really strong on your mind that you want us to speak to uh, very quickly, I'm happy to take a question. Okay. Uh, I'm excited. Someone says, is it just me? These sessions keep getting hotter and better. Yes, so Dr. Nee's part two is loading. Okay. <laughs> I agree that Dr. Nee's part two is loading. I want us to release him to go start his day. He's been up so early. Thank you so much, sir, for being an extraordinary vessel of change, of grace, and of counsel. This has been definitely life-changing for me. And I'm go I, I took some notes because I want to go back and sit with it and now expound on the wisdom you've shared. God bless you, your amazing wife, who is now going to become a lawyer. And yes, thank you for being a part of the work. And God bless you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you for having me once again. Um, thanks for all that you do as well. And um, thanks to um, Simon Fudara for the connection. Um, and yeah, just, um, you know, thank you. Thank you for giving me a platform to, you know, share my story and hopefully this inspires someone to go out there and do something great. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, Taiwo, his handle is, I think it's at Nii Boriri. Am I correct, yes. sir? Nii underscore Boriri. Nii underscore Boriri. Yes, Nii underscore Boriri. That's at Instagram. Nii underscore Boriri on yes. Instagram, okay? So ensure that you go follow and you're going to be bombarded. He even has a great book that I, I, I think you should go download for free. And yes. you would, would you might be fascinated. The Diary of a brain, brain Doctor. Yeah, Brainiac, Brainiac. Oh, the Brainiac, yes, yes. Brainiac. Diary of a Brainiac, yes, yeah. yes. Let's talk so about you, my career, why I chose the career and how I moved from computing to, you know, so somebody who wants to find purpose in career. It's a very small book, just uh, talks about that. Uh, it's, a good, it's a book for maybe that from teenage years, for, 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 for teenagers, for young adults, or people who are transitioning to find that. Very beautiful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank Lots you. of love. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. you so much.